Welcome back to the Maintenance Factory. In this video, we're going to talk about motor contactors and why we use them today. So stick around. So once again, welcome back to the channel. I want to spend a few minutes today talking about um, motor contactors and what their common uses are for and why we even use them in the first place. And before I get into the contactors, I want to spend just a little bit of time uh, comparing them to relays, control relays or power relays, uh, so that you can get a good understanding of the differences between the two. So this is a relay, a control relay. It's a dual pole, dual throw relay, commonly referred to as an ice cube relays. Uh, they come in many different configurations. This is just one. And then I also have a contactor. Uh, this contactor is for a three-phase application, it's got an overload attached to it, so this could be uh, this would be considered a motor starter, and this would be for starting and stopping an electric motor. So right off the bat, uh, you can tell that there's a physical size difference between the two, and control relays don't really get much bigger than this, although they can. Contactors, however, can be really large and weigh uh, hundreds of pounds even, and even bigger than that. But what I want to do is just uh, kind of line out the similarities and the difference between contactors and relays, and then we'll get into more about the contactor itself. So as mentioned earlier, this is a dual pole, dual throw relay, and for simplicity, uh, simplicity's sake, I'm going to draw a single pole dual throw relay. So this relay has a coil inside of it, and it uses 120 volts of AC power to operate correctly. And then uh, situated uh, nearby this coil is a common contact and then a pivot point with a contact that goes to a normally closed um, connection point or contact. And then this one is a normally open contact point. So here you have uh, three places to terminate a uh, power wire for control purposes. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then here you have two more places to terminate wires which would operate the relay itself. So you could have a really small amount of voltage and current to operate this switch right here if you will. And this switch can carry a higher load or a higher amount of current or a higher voltage or a different type of voltage altogether. So we're not going to get into the, the specific type of voltage here. It's really irrelevant. But just imagine that you apply 120 volts of power to this coal and it becomes energized. An electromagnetic field is generated and this contact point now pivots and switches to here. So now you have a path for continuity that has changed from the calm connection to the normally open connection. Then when the magnetic field collapses uh, after the voltage is removed from the coal, then this would switch back to the normally closed connection. So this is probably the simplest diagram I can think of to draw for a control relay and how it operates. So what makes this different than a contactor? The biggest difference in terms of function is this upper portion here that we just erased. So you can imagine this three phase contactor having uh, three pairs of contacts and then you also have three contacts that are mobile, they move, and they're physically connected together. And then on this side, uh, we'll stick with the labeling on the contactor. You would have a L1, an L2, and an L3. And then on this side, you'd have a T1, a T2, and a T3. Uh, on this side here, the L indicates that this is the line side of the contactor and we'll assume that it's connected to a 480 volts alternating current source. And then on this side, we'll just assume that it's uh, connected to a motor, downstream equipment. It may go to an overload and the motor after that, but this is considered the load side of the contactor. <clears throat> so now imagine that this 120 volts AC coil is now energized, electromagnetic fields generated, these contacts are now going to change from the open state to the closed state. And they're all three going to change simultaneously. 
So they're all three going to go from normally open to a closed position. Once they do that, you're going to have a path for continuity to pass from the line side to the load side on all three of these circuits or all three of these phases. So this is probably the biggest uh, difference in terms of function between a contactor and a relay. So now let's get on to why we would even use a contactor. So imagine a, a scenario, um, an industrial setting in a factory, where you would have a processing line that made widgets. And let's say there's 50 uh, three-phase uh, electrical motors that need to be operated on this assembly line to generate these widgets. Um, let's also assume that all 50 of these motors need to turn on and turn off independently of one another at different times and for different lengths and time spans uh, from one another. And let's also assume that it's the Stone Age and we don't have the humble old contactor here to help us out. You would have to have well over 50 people to monitor you know, eyes on the process of these widgets as they go from process to process to process and travel down these conveyors. And these employees, over 50 of them, would have to manually uh, turn on and turn off these motors. So for, for many years, we've had this thing called a knife uh, disconnect switch, and we still use them today to isolate uh, power. And let's assume this disconnect to keep it congruent with the contactor has an L1, an L2, and an L3, and then a T1, T2, T3. And again, it's 480 volts AC. That's real common voltage in an industrial setting, especially in America. And then this three blade knife disconnect um, are physically attached together to a, a big handle that's it's on the outside of a box. So you can imagine a metal enclosure with um, line side conduit and wiring coming in and load side conduit and wiring going out, going to a motor. And in between those conduits is a metal box with a big handle on the side. You could imagine uh, what it would look like to have 50 plus operators in this assembly area turning on and turning off and turning on and turning off and watching these widgets move down the line and as they get transformed in the process. It would be a complete train wreck. There's no way that many people are going to be able to monitor and manage the turning on and turning off of all these motors at the correct time. So at some point in time, someone invented this contactor and in my opinion, the biggest reason why we use contactors today is because they facilitate industrial automation. And there's a second point that I want to bring up just a little later on in the video. So this should look real familiar to a contactor. If we just take the knife disconnect switch out of the picture, we'll draw back in the coil that is operated on 120 volts of AC power. And then we have the three uh, mobile sets of contacts physically interlinked together. So now we've just transformed that manual disconnect where we open and close it to start and stop motors to inserting a contactor in its place. And now we can take this 120 volts of AC power that's a little bit less than 480 volts, considerably less dangerous, and it's less expensive to run some small 14 gauge, 16 gauge wires relative to whatever type wiring we'd have to operate a motor. Uh, and we can take that small gauge wire, run it to some start and stop buttons with a control transformer, and we can remotely operate this motor from any location, you know, 20 feet away, 50 feet away, 100 feet away, however far away we want it to be, essentially. So that's the biggest reason why we wanted to move towards contactors is so that we can uh, set us up for the next step of industrial automation. So instead of having a bunch of start, stop, push button stations uh, throughout the factory for people just to start and stop, now imagine we've introduced a PLC with some, lo uh, with some programming, with some logic. So now you would have a PLC that is programmed with uh, you know, a logic to make widgets and it has an output here, 
and it has an input and then on these inputs you can just imagine we'd have some proximity switches some limit switches some push buttons some selector switches um, the sky's the limit when it comes to input devices but these input devices uh, give uh, information to the PLC the PLC uses that information puts it through the ladder logic and then it outputs it in the form of possibly 120 volts of uh, AC power and can control a motor uh, starting and stopping it through this logic system using some field IO, some inputs. So the biggest reason why we use contactors today uh, to sum all this up is it really facilitates industrial automation, commercial automation applications. Uh, we can go from having 50, hundreds of people uh, operating a, uh, motors, turning stuff on and off, to a handful of people that can manage a system, put a bunch of contactors in the field that can operate motors and control circuits. So what is the, the next reason, or what's the next reason why we would only use contactors? So go back to the example of the knifed disconnect. Let's say, for example, we have a 200 horsepower air compressor and we have all, we, all the means of starting it is just a disconnect. Well, we can go close the disconnect and the motor starts to run. A 200 horsepower motor requires or can use up to 240 amps at full load. And to put that into uh, perspective, a, a common household in America today has a 200 amp service panel in the house. So it would require more power to operate this 200 horsepower motor than what would be um, supplied in a, an everyday household. Not only is that quite a bit of current to just maintain the operation of the motor, but there is this thing called inrush current that occurs whenever the motor goes from a locked rotor position or a standing still position to its uh, full rated RPM. So on a 200 horsepower motor, that could be a little over 1,500 amps. So 1,500 amps, you know, that's enough to operate seven or eight houses in America. Now this inrush current is only going to take place for, you know, maybe a second or less. At max, maybe two seconds. I doubt it would last two seconds. Um, so just imagine physically standing next to a disconnect and closing it knowing that there's 1500 amps of inrush current to start this 200 horse motor. And I'll remind you that there are many motors much larger than 200 horsepower operating uh, right now as we speak. So just imagine how dangerous it would be to stand next to this disconnect, close the switch, and say there's a fault downstream, either a ground fault, phase to ground, phase to phase fault. Whenever that switch gets closed, almost instantaneously the door is going to be blown off of that switch and you're going to be right in the middle of an arc flash arc blast situation unless you have some really sophisticated upstream tripping components so you're in really you're in a really bad position in terms of safety without contactors so just imagine we get rid of that disconnect switch that we use to start and stop the motor we put a contactor in its place that's rated to handle that amount of, of current. And now we can take these start and stop buttons and put the start and stop buttons 50 foot away or 100 feet away from this. And we can start and stop that motor using a really large contactor. And now you've put yourself uh, away from the hazard. So there's, there's safety in distance. So that's the two biggest reasons why, in my opinion, that we use contactors. We use them for industrial automation purposes, and there's a huge safety factor when it comes to using these uh, contactors versus knife disconnect switches. So if you got some value out of the video, I uh, ask you to click the like button, subscribe to the channel, select the notification bell, and uh, you'll be alerted the next time we put out some new content. So thanks for stopping by, and I'll see you again soon.